Welcome to Author's Voice, connecting authors to the world. Today we are watching House Divided. And uh, my name is Bjorn Skaftesen. I am your host. And we will be talking about this fantastic book today. It's almost a phenomenal, a phenomenon of a book. Uh, the War Outside My Window, The Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, 1860 to 1865. It's published by Savis Beatty, and we thank Savis Beatty, as always, for getting our, uh, the authors here. They're, they're really great partners, and the cost is $34.95. Uh, the editor of this work, The War Outside My Window, Jan Kroon, is with us here today, and we're going to meet Jan in just a second. Um, but there's a couple things I want to tell you about before we start. First of all, you're watching us live. We are live on Facebook and we are live on authorsvoice.net. And you have a chance to participate in this show. You at home have a chance to participate in this show. I don't know if you're watching on your computer. I don't know if you're watching on your tablet. I have mine right here. You might be on your phone. You can participate in the show. You can submit questions. So, uh, if you are watching live on Facebook, please, please use the comments section to ask your questions, and I'll see them right here, and uh, Jan can answer them for you. Um, and then if you are watching on authorsvoice.net, of course, you'll see it the, down below the viewer. You'll see a chance where you can submit your questions there. Most importantly, most importantly, buy the book, right? Yes. Buy the book, because that's <laughs> why we're able to bring these shows to you. The authors, uh, the authors write or edit them, as the case mm -hmm. may be. It's a, a labor of love. It's a terrific piece. You're going to want it in your home. But you have to buy it. You order it. The author or editor sh signs it. We ship it out to you. That's author's voice, and that's how it works. Janet Elizabeth Kroon, welcome to author's voice. Thank you for having me. Let me introduce you to the <laughs> folks at home. Janet Elizabeth Kroon holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois, yes. Urbana-Champaign, and a master's in international studies from the University of Dayton. Uh, she taught international baccalaureate, baccalaureate history for nearly two decades at the Fairfax County Public Schools, and then became a Civil War historian. Yes. Jan, tell us about how you... Roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, uh, t give us the short version of the roundabout journey from uh, a teacher to historian. Well, they're both teachers. Yes. I had, I had a side interest in the Civil War, just living in Northern Virginia in, in what we call Mosby's Confederacy. And um, I had been at, at home. I was um, in between some surgeries and saw on a Facebook post the... Um, an article by a Washington Post author about the journals that Leroy had written during the war and thought they were fascinating, great idea, something that could be used in a classroom, and um, brought the book to my publisher's attention. He had not heard of it. He contacted academics, other people in publishing who had also not heard of it, and we decided to to go ahead and, and work on it. Mm -hmm. These, so. these uh, and, and to, to summarize for those mm -hmm. at who are watching that may not even know the first thing about it, this yeah. is a brilliant, uh, a brilliant diary from uh, a young boy, Le Leroy Wiley Gresham, mm -hmm. uh, Macon, Georgia, and he's writing daily about his experiences in the Civil War. Unlike most of our Civil War diaries, he's not a hale and hearty soldier tramping around the landscape. Leroy is, uh, poor little kid, is afflicted with all sorts of problems. Yes. Um, so, but before we get too deep into <laughs> Leroy's <laughs> problems, uh, tell, us, tell us something about that Library of Congress exhibit, because that was really something. That wasn't was it? the um, sesquicentennial yeah. um, of the Civil War that they had put together and brought out some of his journals that people could see. He wrote seven in, in all. Uh, they had other objects, like the contents of Wash, uh, Lincoln's pockets when he was assassinated, other, other documents, um, pictures, things like that. But this uh, seemed to be the, the focal point, especially for that particular uh, Washington Post author. And um, it just the, the, 
the sense of, of who Leroy was even shined in that article. So he's a, a young man. He starts writing when he's 12. He comes from a prominent family, their slaveholding family in Macon, Georgia. His father is, is well known, a very prominent person. And he writes about what he sees, what he hears, what people are doing, um, what's happening in the town. So you see Macon change. You see this prominent family go from the height of their, their influence to towards the end where they're, they're contemplating what, what life will be like if they lose everything. And it looks likely that they may lose everything. So it, it really shows you a lot of, of change in a very, very unique way mm -hmm. through these daily, daily entries in the journal. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's something, uh, something poetic about the idea of, you know, this, uh, of this massive world-changing event that's going on out in the world, and, and there sits Leroy in his room watching it through the window. Right, mm -hmm. right, because he can't go out. He can't, he can't participate in a lot of things, given his afflictions that you alluded to before. Mm -hmm. So he's a, a masterful observer, and um, as a teacher, when I started working with the transcribing, he wrote like a normal 12-year-old, very short, choppy sentences. Um, but within a few years, he's just blossomed into a very eloquent writer, very insightful. He's able to um, make analysis and um, really take things apart on an almost adult level, uh, questioning Confederate policy, questioning some of the decisions that battlefield generals are making, um, and, and really showing a lot of insight that one would not expect for someone that young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think most of the people, I'm pretty sure the people at home w are already thinking, well, let's learn a little bit about the source of poor Leroy's affliction. Mm -hmm. You can't not ask that question. Yes. Uh, what, is the, you know, what are the various factors that brought Leroy to being uh, virtually invalided and, and in his room watching and the world? 1856, he was at school and the boys heard that a building in town had burned. And boys being boys, they decided after school we're going to go and we're going to poke around and see what's left, see what's in there. And that description came from a memoir, an adult memoir of a, a contemporary of Leroy's in old age that we found. And um, the building is the Washington building in Macon. It's now brick. It was wood at the time. But as the boys are poking around, the, the brick chimney starts wobbling. And somebody says, oh, we got to get out of here. The chimney's falling. And Leroy was the one caught by the brick. And it totally smashed his left leg. So he had, you know, given the medical expertise at the time, several breaks that they had to, had to heal. And what we learned from working on this book was that um, many, many people had tuberculosis in their systems at that point in time. About 70% of people in the United States had tuberculosis, but it was dormant. And because his body was trying to work on this leg, um, it became activated, and it's opportunistic, and it started to take over. And so the book opens with Leroy going to see a prominent physician in Philadelphia, Dr. Joseph Pancoast, uh, to see if they can help him help cure him. Leroy is convinced throughout the book that Dr. Pankos is the one who can cure him of all his ailments. Mm -hmm. and, um, but he's not able to help him. His parents know, Dr. Pankos knows, he has a rare form of tuberculosis. And there's really not anything he can do to help him. So his advice was keep him laying down, here's some more medication, and good luck. Oh, That's basically okay. it. So he's, he doesn't understand what the illnesses he has. He does not know he has a terminal disease. He looks forward constantly. Um, even in the, the last few months of his life, he's looking forward and wondering, what am I going to become in, in my life? What can I do? I can't do some, you know, I can't go to college. I can't do this. I can't do that. But what can I do? I can't just sit here. Mm -hmm. So he's driven, internally driven. Um, He's inquisitive, 
Um, he's very skilled at mathematics. He's a very, very good chess player. He reads everything he can get his hands on. He's reading Shakespeare at 13 and 14 years of age and enjoying it. Um, so he's just uh, an exceptional young man, which um, I, I imagined as I was doing a lot of the transcription, I could imagine him in with my students, my contemporary students, and he would fit in with them. He had a wry sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, he just wanted to know everything, and um, he was just, um, you fall in love with this kid. Yeah which is something that the article points out, is that you fall in love with this kid. Now, who are some of the other, who are some of the other people in his life? And before you answer mm -hmm. it, I want to I comment on something you've decided to do in your editorial process, mm -hmm. in that uh, you've created something in this diary, which would normally appear in a play script or in a movie mm -hmm. script. Uh, you actually give us a dramatis personae yes. uh, right up front. And before we even open the book, we learn a little bit about the people we're going to meet. Mm -hmm. And it's an extensive web of relationships. Yes. An impressive web of relationships <laughs> that this kid has. And I know it was a lot of work to yeah. get to the bottom of that web when he's mm -hmm. calling his relatives by the pet names or the short names. That exactly. Mm -hmm. the, the day I found out who, who um, Cousin Eliza was, was a big day for me. I even <laughs> posted on Facebook because Eliza and her three children were cousins. Um, and the family tree I put together now has 1,700 people on it. The name Elizabeth or Eliza, there are 60 some women on that tree with that name. And I had to find the right one who was evacuating from Savannah with three little kids. And um, there were other names as well, where you know, Cousin Jenks, that's not a common name. It wasn't a family name. Wiley, his middle name is Wiley. That was his grandmother's maiden name, his maternal mother's maiden name. Um, so having to go through that and identify all these individuals was a major challenge. But it helped put together the whole story so that the reader, when they start, they don't have to wonder, well, who's this? Right. Who's that? And they were very close. These families, even though they didn't all live in Macon, um, most of the Greshams lived in Macon, but a number of people lived in Athens, Georgia, which is where his only grandparent who was alive during the Civil War, his grandmother, resided. Um, other family members that had other, other properties in other parts of Georgia um, pulling them all together when they're all so interconnected in each other's lives, was, I felt really important. Mm -hmm. um, he has a, one brother, one sister, two siblings that died early in their lives, and um, but this huge extended family mm -hmm. that included six of her mother's brothers that went into the war, numbers of cousins um, that had different roles in the war, and keeping all of them straight was was part of the challenge. Does his family members come and go pretty frequently? Yes. So the house yes. is not just the nuclear no. four N people? No, there's, there's, people? there's pam p family members that appear, and they come and go. There's prominent members in the community who also come and go that they interact with on, on a regular basis. So I had to figure out who those individuals were as well. Um, and it just has made getting to know the antebellum and then wartime making, um, it's just, just amazing when we have gone to the, um, the cemetery where the family is laid to rest, Rose Hill, which is a unique cemetery. It's all, all terraced. Each family has its own little block. You drive through there and oh, I know that family, I know this family, I know that family. These are cousins and it's, it shows you how inter, interrelated and how dependent people were on one another. Mm -hmm. Even though there was distance in time, they still knew each other extremely well. And then another, uh, then uh, the, next, the next chapter in this dramatist persona, the next project that you uh, mm -hmm. brought in is, of course, as we, as we see in all other uh, uh, stories of the upper class Annabellum and War South, mm -hmm. there's this entire other population yes it's also an important part of his life and right there every day there are enslaved people yes. coming and going as you said uh, the Greshams were one of the larger slave holding families mm -hmm. uh, two plantations in the next county over yes but 
still, I, you seem, it seems to be five or six permanent residents there in the house with him that are, uh, that, that are uh, housemates yeah. with him. Absolutely. And he interacts. So what is, what is Leroy's take on slavery, on these other, uh, on these enslaved people living? Does he they, notice it? Or? Uh, he notices them. He notices um, that, you know, there are other people that are living in other circumstances than him. But they've always been there. So that it's a constant in his life that, that Mary has been the cook and that Howard is the, the slave who takes pretty good care of the property and w will take the wagon down to the Houston County um, plantations that they had uh, which is about a 35-mile ride, so it was a one-day wagon ride, um, to get supplies or to bring supplies from, um, from Macon down to the plantations and how interdependent the house in Macon was with the, with the plantation properties and the people down there. So there's not only the eight people who worked and lived in the home, um, including three-year-old Florence. She was three in the 1860 census, actually born the day that Leroy's leg was injured. Um, he tells us that in his writing. Um, and she's growing up as a child in the house, a, a playmate for one of his cousins, one of his you know, little white cousins. And um, that, that was just considered normal. Um, everybody had a staff. Everybody that they knew did that. So he doesn't really talk about the um, morality of slavery. Um, in some of his father's extant letters, we've read some, some, some of that where he, he writes in one letter that he almost wished he didn't have any slaves. He felt so bad because they're working so hard in such miserable, muddy conditions because it had rained so hard. Um, but we don't hear that much from Leroy. Mm -hmm. um, we hear him learning things from Howard and some of the other people who come down. Frank builds him a chess table and puts wheels on it so it can roll around. Um, and he seems to be very fond of these people. They were, they were part of his life. He does have a slave companion, a young boy um, about his age named Alan, who becomes a, a constant in his life, um, doing things for him, because there are many things he cannot do for himself. He has a little wagon, doesn't he? He, do, he does. That's he how can he gets get him. out if Alan goes out with right. him in the wagon? Yeah, it, it's usually Alan who pulls him around town in the wagon. Um, because he can't walk, and it was before wheelchairs. Wheelchairs were a byproduct of the Civil War. So he gets around on this, this little wagon. We don't know what it looks like. We do know that it was occasionally upgraded, so it was more comfortable for him. But basically it was his brother, some of his friends, or Alan, who would um, take him around town to different places. But he did not go to school. He did not go to church. Leroy was not able to attend family weddings or funerals, and there are several. So the people in the town will often send him a piece of the wedding cake the next day, left, you know, some of the nice things that are left over so he can have some of the sweets because he does have an incredible sweet tooth. Um, Howard teaches him how to grow the cantaloupe, which is his favorite vet fruit. So um, there's, there's a dependence on these people. Yeah, so. yeah. And... Uh, I noticed, yeah, like you said, he does, he does notice them, but he's also a child who's lived yes. with this uh, institution mm. his entire life. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there yeah. is there's no, uh, uh, no questioning of the reality that, right. that he lives in. Now, we can right. see uh, uh, about the war itself. Uh, Leroy finds out about the war through newspapers. And yes. one of the things we see in his entries is, and you mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. uh, he very quickly matures in his ability to analyze what yes. he's getting from the newspaper. Yes. Um, he gets not news not only from the newspapers. He gets it from telegraphs. Sometimes Mr. Clisby, who is the editor of the, of the, the main Macon newspaper, will bring up the telegraphs because he knows Leroy's interested in them. Um, he, there's letters from the family members that are out on the front. Um, he talks about his uncle Edge, who's Edgeworth Bird, who was another uh, he's property owner in the Sparta, Georgia area. Um, he was in Northern Virginia in Fairfax, and he, he talked about getting to see Generals Beauregard, Longstreet, 
and Jefferson Davis when he came into town. So he's, he talks about those kinds of things. Um, you hear stories of the, the relatives and the friends who came back. Um, he finds out, for example, during uh, Antietam, after the news came back after that, Leroy writes that everybody they knew who was at, at that battle was either wounded or killed. Everybody was either wounded or killed. So um, it becomes, it, even though he's not there, he does not see anything. The war doesn't really come to Macon until 1864. Um, it's a very personal thing because of all the people he knows who are there. Mm -hmm. And you, had, uh, you live up there in Northern Virginia. I yes. And so one of the first things, I, I went straight to, of course, I picked, opened the book, of course, being the kind of things I like to read, I went straight to the battle days. So yes. when, did, when did Leroy find out about uh, the first Battle of Bull Run? And he finds yeah. out very quickly that his, uh, his neighbor, Colonel Bartow, mm -hmm. uh, was killed there. And of course, right. Colonel Bartow's monument is prominent there on the mm -hmm. Bull Run battlefield. It certainly was mm -hmm. first. And then they... Mm -hmm. The Federals took it down, and then it got yeah. put up again. <laughs> but um, so I, I found that very intriguing because I thought of myself standing there on Henry Hill, and with the Bartow Monument, and then here's Leroy talking mm -hmm. about his neighbor, uh, who had led the local company off, and yes, who got yeah, he he talks a lot about the training that went on in Macon. Um, a number of the units were trained there at the fairgrounds. They had a fairground south of town. Was a racetrack um, was there also. Um, he talks about the munitions factory. They had an, a an armory, an arsenal, um, and a ballistics laboratory that were all developed in Macon because it was a railroad crossroads. So it was an easy place for people to gather because of the railroads and then get trained. So he keeps track not only of the local boys that leave, in including that, that unit, but the other ones who have been through town and that he's gotten to know and see. Um, later on, he talks about the officer prison camp. They take the training ground and turn it into a prison camp. And then d they develop hospitals in some of the public buildings. Um, the officers were imprisoned in Macon. The enlisted men went off to Andersonville, which is wh how Macon becomes part of the battle um, in 1864 when the Union Army under Sher um, Sherman, Sheridan, Sherman, um, <laughs> This, and yeah, um, General Stoneman came Stoneman, down. Stoneman, yeah. To try to, yeah. Yes, they were trying to get to Andersonville to rescue those men and failed. Mm -hmm. Stoneman was captured, um, and surrendered his entire cavalry. Um, but Leroy was on the roof of the house watching that whole battle. He could see the sun, he, Battle he, of Sunshine Church up, up, he the, could. up the way from Macon, couldn't he? He could, mm -hmm. because the house was up on a, on a crest, mm -hmm. up in a high part of the town. It goes down into a valley where you have the Okmulgee River and the... the Federals were on the other side where it also rises to a crest. So they were firing at Macon from about two miles away. And um, um, one house, the Cannonball House, it's known today, uh, was actually hit. The lady in the house was coming down the stairs and the Cannonball flew through the front door. So um, that was the only house that was damaged. But he, he sees all that. He sees all that happening. Um, Does he make some comment by the time, you know, the, shortly after that, and by November, Sherman and the rest of the mar army marches very close to Macon. They do. And so does he have much to comment on when the, when the Yankees are that close to him? Um, he does. He is the man of the house at that point. His brother has become a um, topographer in the Army of Northern Virginia, and he's in the Shenandoah Valley um, around the Roanoke area. And... Um, his father has been pulled into the home guard because he's, he's an older man, he's 53, and he has, he has to go and serve as well. So Leroy is left at home with his mother and his sister, and because they're coming so close, they send his sister away so that she'll be safe. She's two years younger than Leroy is. So she's about 15 years old, and they felt it was too dangerous for her to stay in town if it's invaded. So um, a matron lady offers to take her with her uh, to another town, and uh, Leroy keeps track of how much money he gives Minnie. And Minnie goes off um, with this other older widowed woman uh, who they now call Aunt. So, um, um, so she's safe. Mm -hmm. And they have to go and retrieve her later when everything's all clear and both Father and Thomas are back at home. Okay. Yeah. okay. 
Well, there's so much to learn about in, uh, in uh, Willie's, in Leroy's story. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, when we get to the, the end of his life, as you say, he, he dies here in the book in front of us. Yes. And, uh, and some very, uh, very affecting passages. And I think uh, very affecting for the fact that you've chosen to just serve them up the way they are. Yeah. To, to stay very close to uh, the, his writing as it went along and the mm -hmm. commentary on it. Mm -hmm. uh, w was that something that you decided to do early rather mm -hmm. than inserting more of, you know, more narrative from your pen into the story? Um, we decided to use footnotes. Yeah. Um, because we wanted to leave the writing to be his. Uh, as a high school teacher, it was really hard for me to not correct the misspellings. Um, he spells Tuesday wrong for a couple of years, and you know he gets it right, and I'm like, yes, and then it's wrong again. I'm like, oh dear, um, he made a mistake and made it right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that was that was something that we decided to leave it as authentic as possible, and then to explain in footnotes um, any kind of elaboration that would be needed for the reader, um, so that it, it just we weren't inserting ourselves into his story because we weren't there. And we did not know for the longest time what it was that he had. We could not agree on what it was that he had because he didn't know. So he couldn't tell us. So we had hints uh, here and there. And um, my publisher, Ted Savas, decided to have me write up what I called Leroy's medical records. It was all the um, excerpts from, from the whole transcript that were medically related. And we sent those to another one of Ted's authors, Dr. Dennis Rosbach, uh, who is a surgeon, and he came up with a diagnosis that surprised us both. Uh -huh. We had no clue, mm -hmm. um, because there are stereotypes to different kinds of diseases, and this one didn't follow any of the stereotypes that we were aware of, because tuberculosis doesn't take that form. Right. I want to talk yeah. about that in a minute. Yeah. Here. Now, for the folks at home, we're, we're scheduled for a 30-minute show today, but there's nobody coming on after us, and we're having a good time. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna press our time a little bit uh, here because there's there's a couple of things I really want to know from your perspective, okay. uh, Jan. But for the folks at home, we're, that's we're probably telling you about as much of the story of Leroy as we're going to on this on this uh, show because we want you to buy the book. You need if you really want to get to know this kid, he's a great kid. If you want to get to know this kid, mm -hmm. you need to buy it and read his words. Yeah. Uh, there's only so much we can say as right. far as... He, as, it, as it far is, as. he's funny. He's yeah. amusing. Um, he's, he's got a biting wit. Um, he tells you what he thinks of people, um, including the generals. He has his favorites. He has his not favorites. Um, and, and some of the, the revelations he has on political figures are also kind of amusing as well. Um, so yeah, you definitely so, I mean, you want to read. You want to read what he yeah. what he wrote. But what I want to ask you, Jan, is you've spent twenty years teaching. Yes. And you've spent twenty years teaching kids that are his age. His age. Yeah. Uh, so how effective or how effective can be the actual artifacts of something like these journals? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, how effective can it be in the classroom? if you have actually an opportunity to show the kids some... some uh, that was one of the things that, the, that from that initial Facebook post that really attracted me because it, I have, have really had a good luck using primary artifacts. Um, they can be documents, news, newspaper articles, um, journal entries are very powerful. And when you can get a kid something written by someone who is the same age as your students, they can put themselves into that person's position and feel what it was like to possibly have been living during the war at that time, to watch his brother go off and fight, um, to watch friends go off and fight, to find out that somebody that they care about very deeply is a prisoner of war. They had to deal with that as well. And um, I found that to be a really good mechanism to hook kids in. So I've often used artifacts, um, primary source documents, um, going back as far as I can, 
I think the oldest one I've ever used was a political cartoon that was um, a satire on uh, Cromwell in England. Um, and just because I think they are so powerful. And some of them can be downright amusing, too. Um, and then talking about the stories of real people, as opposed to just focusing on the presidents and the kings and the prime ministers, you talk about the real, actual people who experienced some of these things can be amazingly powerful. Um, I taught World War II um, from the perspective of um, civilian populations and the abuse of civ civilian populations, everything from the rape of Nanjing to the Holocaust to the forced repatriation after the war, um, Japanese internment camps, and the kids became engrossed not only in the battles, but in the stories of these people who survived these kinds of atrocities. And knowing that they had grandparents or great-grandparents, depending on how old the kid was, that were that same age. So we had a Holocaust survivor who used to come in and speak to our students, and she was only a few months older than my own mother. Mm -hmm. And their existence, their growing up, was so, so very different. Right. So, um, so something like this, something, something like this yeah. book, or something like the diaries in Library of Congress and the exhibit yes. that they created, right. uh, it can be enormously useful for, right. for teachers. And I know Library of Congress has other similar mm -hmm. things. I know mm -hmm. Gilder Lehrman Institute yes. in New York mm -hmm. is built yes. for that. And, and they went mm -hmm. out and collected stuff from people like us. Right. They collected those documents right. from well, the National people Archives. like Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. And yes. then now they're sharing them uh, with teachers. If you have any other uh, any other favorites you want to suggest to oh, I've gone, the teachers out there? I have gone to the Virginia Historical Society in Richmond. Mm -hmm. They have wonderful archives um, down there. I've gone to some of the presidential libraries. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to the Woodrow Wilson Library, and they were very generous with, with what they had um, in Stanton, Virginia. Um, so working with archives, um, archival documents, can be, it, it can be hard work for a teacher but it can also be really rewarding when you come up with something that's really awesome for kids to, to work through. I am working on a curriculum guide with a, a friend of mine who is a middle school teacher of English in New Hampshire, which is a common core state. Virginia is not common core, but we're blending the two. Okay. We're gonna use Virginia history standards with the common core English and writing um, to really uh, help teachers use this book as a source with students um, so that the kids could get the most of the book from many different levels. We often have kids with many different at, um, academic abilities in our classrooms today. So that way you can you know, have something for the upper end kids and have something else that the, the kids who maybe need more support to get through a book like this. So that's available for them as well. Great. Great. Yeah. Now, there's what the last thing I want to, uh, the last topic I want to touch on before mm -hmm. before we uh, wrap this up is you mentioned it before. Your colleague, Dr. Rasback, yes, uh, has. Uh, there's going to be more to this. Yes, <laughs> there's going to yes. be more to this story. Well, first of all, your curriculum is going to be an important yeah. part of it. But the but Dr. Dennis Rasback is producing what apparently is going to be called "I Am Perhaps Dying." Yes, and so uh, before we get him here, <laughs> you tell tell us. How did Dr. Rasback support your, uh, your research, and how did you and uh, Mr. Savis bring him in, and what did he find yeah. that surprised you? Um, what he found was, uh, after we, we sent him the, the document with, with all of his medical complaints, all the, the medicines that he used, um, all of his physical complaints, um, from the broken leg all the way to the end, um, Again, because Leroy didn't know what he had. His parents did, but they did not tell him. They made that conscious choice. Um, I probably would have made the same choice um, to keep my child alive and, and hopeful and around as much as, as long as possible. Um, but he was the one two weeks later who, who called Ted and told him, I've got a diagnosis. And it was um, a rare form of tuberculosis that is not often is not often seen, um, called spinal tuberculosis or POTS disease. And um, <clears throat> you don't have the polite cough in the white handkerchief with sp spots of blood. 
that would have been a clue to him. He would have known then what it was. But he never had that as a symptom. Um, he had a lot of pain in his back and in his legs. Um, he oftentimes will say, chop off my leg or saw off my leg um, because it was painful. Um, and he had a, a natural sense that everything he was experiencing went back to the leg. And in a roundabout way, it actually did. But um, he, he was able to explain to us the copious amounts of, of powerful medications this kid was taking. Um, it went everything from using lavender to relax him to lots of beer. He's drinking porter beer. He's drinking Catawba wine, um, which we look at today and think, he's underage. Well, that, that wasn't so much the problem then, but that was, that was calories for Leroy. That was a lot of times he couldn't keep his food down. Um, so that beer and the wine would relax him, and he had caloric intake with that. Um, he was taking opium. He was taking a compound of, uh, called Dover's powder, which was half opium and half the dried active ingredient of syrup of Ipecac. So you couldn't take too much of it without throwing it back up. Uh, he was taking morphine, laudanum, compounds with mercury. All, it, it was just horrific. And I wanted to know, how is he able to function when he's got all this stuff that we worry about today in his system? And Dr. Rosbach's answer was simple. He, he, he said that he had a legitimate pain need. And the pain medication would go to the brain, cut the pain. So it allowed the rest of his mind to function at the high level that it was functioning at. Whereas people that are, are taking um, things that they're not allowed to have in school, <laughs> um, it, opiates, you name it, they don't generally have a legitimate pain need. They may start with one, but after their need for that medication is gone, then they've got the, the hook and they keep taking it. And um, he said that's how he was able to still take all this stuff and write so well. All right. And so completely. So he not only, you know, explained to us what was killing this boy, but also why all the medications. Well, watch out in the not too distant future for I Am Perhaps Dying by Dennis <laughs> Rasbeck, MD. Yes. And uh, it will be a necessary uh, addendum, appendix yes. to this remarkable yes. book. Uh, and uh, The War Outside My Window, The Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, 1860 to 1865. We're going to talk about it.